I'm Ann Petrick, Vice President of Research for Vistage, and I am happy to host the latest webinar in our Peak Performer webinar series. This series is designed to support your leadership climb by bringing the most trusted experts to the Vistage community, those who provide exceptional insight and best practices to help you navigate new challenges and possibilities. Now, as emerging technologies are projected to transform businesses, since earlier this year, we've been using our Vistage CEO Confidence Index surveys to gauge adoption amongst our members. We found that in March, our Q1 survey revealed that 34% of CEOs reported beliefs that open and generative AI, such as ChatGPT, was not currently relevant to their business. Then fast forward to June, analysis of the Q2 survey revealed that 33% of CEOs said their organization was not using or testing AI. And our latest survey, the Q3 survey that closed just a few weeks ago, revealed that 30% of CEOs reported that their budget would not change or be reallocated to add or accommodate AI capabilities. However, on the other end of the spectrum, when looking at those budgeting for AI, 65% of CEOs are early adopters of AI with 10% planning to increase spend with existing vendors and 25 reporting plans to spend with new vendors and an additional 30% plan to reallocate their existing budget for these new tools. So wherever you fall on that spectrum, today's focus is how your peers have found success in leveraging this technology that is booming in popularity. This will help you understand new ways that you could be looking at AI. So welcome to our panelists. We have the CEO of the Kidney Experts, Sri Malay, President of Educate LLC, Stacey Schultz, and Founder and President of Direct Online Marketing, Justin Seibert. So welcome to our panelists. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. And we're going to start with Shri. So welcome Shri. Can you first share what your company does and the types of clients that you support? Absolutely, thank you, Anne. Uh, I'm Dr. Shri Malay. I'm a kidney doctor and nephrologist here in West Tennessee, uh, where we have four locations uh, and we cover a large territory of uh, patients here in West Tennessee. Uh, basically, we take care of patients who have kidney problems. Our mission statement is to rid the world of the need, need for dialysis, and that's where we're at. Okay, excellent. So in our survey, you stated that you're using AI to respond to reviews um, with patient communications, as well as to write copy for your website. I think you also mentioned you use 20 or 30 different apps, but can you start with a high level on what these tools enable you to do um, when you're communicating with, with patients yourself or your team? Uh, it's really useful for communication. It streamlines what we're trying to say. Actually, you can just be really ugly and aggressive and just say, I want to tell, I want to tell the person this. And then AI will step in and it'll it'll make it really pleasant to read. Uh, it it you can just tell it what you want it to say and then it will rewrite it for you. I've been able to use uh, I've been able to write an LOR, which would normally take me the letter of recommendation would take me 45 minutes with AI. I knocked it out in five minutes. Uh, my Visage profile, if you guys check it out, Shri Mule at, at Visage, uh, it, the whole thing was written using various um, AI for each section. Uh, it allows us when we want to communicate with patients to just type in what we want to say, and then it just pretties it up, makes it something that's really nice to read. It's a really, really helpful communication tool. Now, what apps are you using for that? Are you using ChatGPT or are there some things built into some of the other applications that you use in your business? Okay, so I'm a little bit of a tech tech junkie. Does uh, websites online that allow you to purchase lifetime deals? So a good one's called appsumo.com. You go on there, you become a member and you can, at any given time, there's two or three tools, AI tools that are available. The really good one that I've been enjoying using a lot is called Hello Scribe. I use that quite extensively. And then I don't think I've written a single email in God knows how long. There's a there's an AI tool called Ghostwrite for Gmail. And you just tell it, hey, tell so-and-so that uh, I need to return the package. And then it'll be a response to the email that they sent. They'll say, well, dear 
it'll be a response to that email and then it'll include the message you want. So it's called Ghostwrite, uh, Hello Scribe. Uh, Ghostwrite is built off of chat GPT. Mm -hmm. um, at, okay. um, several engines are out there, but AppSumo is kind of where you find lifetime deals. And what I said, I've got 20 to 30. I don't even remember their names. I've just tried mm -hmm. them out. You can buy a lifetime deal for a hundred bucks or 40 bucks. And you've got this. These are all new AI tools that are in development, but very helpful. Yeah. So are, are you worried about security at all with some of these new tools or the fact that you're subscribing to them guarantees you a certain level of security? I'm not, there's no PHI being shared, uh, patient health information. So I'm not too worried about it. Okay. But uh, if that's a concern, you would want to make sure it's HIPAA compliant. Yes. Okay. So you mentioned productivity, that it shortens some time. What kind of other success have you had so far leveraging these technologies? Uh, we've used copy for the website, social media postings, and the whole team has access to different AI tools. I don't, uh, to be honest, I don't think we've, we're leveraging it enough. Uh, I think we should, we're in the process of developing an AI tool team within the company that would focus on getting everyone on board on AI. I think that's the most important next step. Uh, there's no reason not to be using AI in communication. It, it makes your copy so much more pleasant to read, more professional in, in a fifth or a fifth of the effort you don't you don't you just tell it hey i wanted to say this it goes back rewrites it for you in about two to three minutes and actually in the whole process you would spend maybe 10 15 minutes writing an email this thing takes care of it in two to three minutes that's what i meant to say okay so your volume of communications your speed and the volume you're able to handle have have improved Mm -hmm. And then there's tools that if you get a really long email, you can have another AI mm -hmm. tool summarize what you're looking at. Uh, you can have it summarize big, uh, big, big documents, uh, research papers, those kind of things. Very, very helpful on that front as well. Mm. So those things that are too long to read, you can just ask for the, the top level takeaways. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Excellent. Um, any other business success you've had so far? Does this help um, with staffing, um, your hiring, any challenges hiring? What other kind of results have you seen? Uh, with hire, we're not using AI for hiring. Uh, we use other tools for that predictive index, which many people investors are familiar with. Uh, yeah, not, not yet. I haven't thought of a use case, but I'm sure there is one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you could probably go through through applicants and narrow it down for us. I think there there would be some use there. Excellent. And but have you found that you need? You know, I know that the big thing that we've heard is that AI won't take your job. That someone who knows AI might take your job. So, do you find that that your team is very effective in leveraging this? No, we're, we're not. We're not there yet. We we need to do a lot more. I agree. If you're if you're not doing AI today, you're already behind the curve. Six months from now, I, I mean, I think the whole whole business atmosphere is going to change, and AI is going to be a big part of that. Okay. Well, thank you, Sri. I know that that communications is the number one way that you found efficiency, and I think it's you know outside of you know marketing copy is one thing we've heard, but I don't think. We've thought about how that can shore up some of your communications or make write, writing some of those documents, um, like you mentioned, the letter of recommendation easier. So thank you so much. And, and we do have our AI network where you could share some of the tools that you're using uh, with our members as well. So now we're gonna transition to Stacy. So Stacy, can you share more about your company and the clients that you serve? Yeah, thanks, Anne, and hi, Vistage community. Um, I'm Dr. Stacey Schultz. I'm currently the president of Educate LLC. Uh, what we do is support schools by providing meaningful adult learning experiences so that they can have powerful student outcomes. And um, we've done a lot of various things with AI, but one of the first steps we took was say, everyone go play with AI, let's go play. See what you find, see what you learn, see what questions you have. We provided, you know, a list of 
potential starting places, but we encourage people to really go out and find their own way in. Um, and then what we did was built a design team. Well, first we sent, a, we sent a survey out. We said, okay, what did you learn? What did you play with? What are you trying, et cetera, et cetera. And then we built, we use those insights in our design team to really consider what is AI at Educate? What is our target state? What is our um, goal? What is our mission around utilizing AI? And what are the ethical guidelines that will drive us? Um, and so one of the things out of that is really being transparent with everyone at work when you're using AI and how you're using AI. Um, and so that's one of the things that not only doing that has really helped us as an organization learn more from each other, but we do it in our external newsletters as well. And it's actually driven more business to us. So that's been a really powerful um, outcome that we weren't necessarily seeing. We were trying to model like how to use AI at a school because a lot of schools are coming to us like, we're scared. We don't know what to do. There's this AI tool out there. Are students using AI? Do we? How do we make assessments? Are teachers using AI for lessons? And and so we we um, we're just trying to model like, well, what are some things you can do um, as a community to be having these conversations and start building that transparency and awareness. Yeah, you mentioned you got new clients from it. Is that from your your marketing communications being tightened up or is that more from the capabilities that you developed using AI? It's interesting. It's actually been from our, our own exploration of how we use AI, right? And sharing that more openly with, um, with people. So both how have we used AI um, to tighten up our messaging? Mm -hmm but also um, what are we learning and thinking about AI? So for example, one of the um, newsletters was like, hey, tell, your, tell everyone to play with AI, right? <laughs> Similar to what we did at our organization. So we, we really like to take that inside out approach, let us try it first and then share it outward um, with others. Yeah, in our survey, you shared that you had created the ethics and quality guide. So can you share, what are some of the guiding principles that you included in that? Yeah, I mean, transparency is one, um, as, as I mentioned. Um, we also talk a lot about equity, right? So one of the biggest concerns around AI is, you know, it's built by people. So there are biases embedded in AI. And so how do you recognize those biases? How might you prompt? for the AI to overcome those biases and how, what other critical lens might you put on the outputs that you're getting when you enter something into AI. And the other thing that we talked about is centering the human experience within the AI. Um, and so what does that mean? One of the first things that means is, well, how do you partner? How do you utilize AI, not necessarily replace you as a person, but there was a really awesome article recently in Ed Surge, it's a popular, you know, education industry publication. And the teacher was saying, hey, in the next five years, AI is probably going to replace me as an academic teacher. But what it's not going to replace me is as a human teacher and really focusing on like social skills and leadership development. And like really that humanity piece is something that he was mentioning like sometimes gets lost in the classroom because of the day-to-day -day expectation of getting through content. He felt really excited about, oh, wow, we can really personalize a student's learning experience, have them kind of go and do that. And then we can talk about it and we can like think differently and create together from what we're learning. Yeah. Talk about more about the ability to, cre you know, to create custom curriculum or approaches based on leveraging AI technology? Yeah, actually, and we're currently partnering with an AI organization to build our own tool that will service to support the coaching and workshops and, and development that we're doing within schools. And so, for example, that tool will collect the data from all the different sources that a school has on a student and these are closed to AI because data mm -hmm. sharing data is a concern, right? So we have a lot of the AI law or data laws um, in mind as we're building this product and it's closed, right? So it's only open to those communities, but it builds a database of the data of each student. And then it also asks teachers for inputs and updates on, okay, what have you tried? What's working? What's important? 
It also asks the student, hey, what's your lifelong goal here? What are you hoping? And it also asks the parent. And so it really does this um, really multi-pronged approach to, okay, if a student's struggling, what are some things you can really try to reach them now? And what that does is really goes beyond, you know, one teacher's ability to consider, hey, what can I do to support this teacher? Because something we hear often is I've tried so many things, right? And I'm still not breaking through. And it's like, well, hey, now you have this tool that you can tap into so many different perspectives at once, while it's also analyzing a multitude of data about the student to provide you some really personalized ideas on how to give that student access and help them excel. So a very bespoke program for a teacher, a one-to-one -one program that it, it's easily executable or created by, by a teacher. So I think that's interesting. Adam Grant in our conversation, he said that in, when, when I asked him about AI, he talked about the fact that there will all, you know, human plus computer is where the power is. There's, you know, not just human, yeah. not just computer. So it sounds like that's definitely something that that you're embracing and really thinking about what are the, the unique skills that that people bring and what how the AI can can help them. Yeah. Yeah. We're really asking ourselves as an organization, but also our clients on, you know, what do we think it means to to be human? Um, mm -hmm. And so what does that mean about how you design um, schools moving forward? Because it will, it should shift. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it will shift. Right, <laughs> and right. so what does that look like? Interesting, right? Yeah, we've all been focused on the the shifting of the office becoming a more collaborative learning place. But yeah, that would, that would bleed into schools as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and anything um, else in terms of best practices, how you've trained your staff formally? I know you said go play, but how do you capture some of those best practices or identify the areas that you really need to be um, more formally trained? So we offer an upskilling program that helps formally train on the AI wide tools that we're using as an organization. Um, how we determine those AI tools is by doing an evaluation process. Um, we created our own evaluation process, but there are a million out there. <laughs> um, but we created our own that was really unique to our situation. Um, and we partnered with AI to create our own, I should say, <laughs> um, and in that tool. Um, and then, so each month we ask people to update that evaluation process and the tools that they're using. We give some time and space, we send out reminders and we're like, okay, everyone add to our tool. And then our continuous improvement team really mm -hmm. sits back and looks at those tools as holistically as an organization and say, okay, maybe these are some that we should really tag into because it supports um, stronger efficiency. It's really seamless in our system. It helps build different insights that we need. Um, it creates smoother processes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we'll begin the process of rolling that out. And part of that rollout is that training, right? And so we do a lot of like screencast training um, where we ask people to do it on their own and attend an office hour. Um, in the office hour, we answer any questions. Um, we also have Slack channels. Um, for, you know, what are you using? How are you using it? Just kind of keep that open dialogue. Where are you having trouble? I mean, recently, you know, the D New York City DOE said, yeah, we're going to use ChatGPT. And then they get in and it's all blocked. <laughs> and so we get all these like Slack, like, hey, what's your workaround today? You know, so there's like a lot of how are we using, but also how are you in the moment making those shifts? So we use it both inside our organization on an operational standpoint, but also externally day-to-day um, -day with clients. Yeah. Did you encounter any resistance with any of the of your team in terms of like jumping in and using it and being more curious about it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we do from our clients too, right? You have your early adapters who are like, yeah, sure. Let's just do this to our, I'm sort of interested. I'm going to put my toe in the water and see what this is about to the, I'm just not really sure. So what I did was as a leader actually is um, modeled it. I would just use it openly in a meeting, you know, okay, you know what, let's take this to chat GPT or let's take, I, I like Bard. 
um, let's take this to Bard or let's put this in Jasper or who's going to put some tone on it that um, we want for our, you know, and um, personification for our client. And so like, those are some things that just like, I would just in the moment say, okay, let's just do this. Let's just try this out and see what happens here. And the more um, I did that and some of my other colleagues, we saw people just finding other ways to be like, oh yeah, I could just do this. Um, particularly like our sales you know in, in a sales huddle they're like hey let's who's someone coming up let's go let's put in a let's create an email together yeah and I think it's fascinating I mean sometimes there's great stuff that comes out of it sometimes not so great, not so great. But, <laughs> but, but if yeah. you can take the nuggets that are really good like Sheree mentioned in terms of you know shoring up the communication making it tighter more professional um, you know there there's a, I think a lot more upside probably than than downside and that's where the humans are needed to to figure out um, that matter of taste and appropriateness and using the right vernacular etc well absolutely and you know we have a rule like it you know you shouldn't just take what it spits out ever <laughs> like that's kind of one of our rules like be critical about it and if you do just take it it should be for internal discussion only right and so sometimes I find myself like I'll be someone will send something for feedback and I'm like okay I just put this in chat GPT here's what chat GPT said mm. take what you want you do it but um you know right now the time demand I can't prioritize like providing some detailed feedback or something right but just right. giving sort of that but yeah, we have a rule. You don't just take it and put it out there in the world without mm -hmm. first saying that, but also you have to really think about, um, yeah, how's it match? And actually we had an interesting time in our design where we were putting together our target state and we all wrote our target states. We chose our target state and we're like, oh, chat GPT, summarize it, put it all together. And we found that actually we had to do more work to make it mm -hmm. what we wanted than what chat GPT spit out for us. And so we decided, yeah, and we decided, you know what, we like what we did better. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it is time saving, but there is also a criticalness that is important to have around it. Yeah, interesting that, yeah, that human is required. In your ethics and guidelines, mm -hmm. do you have anything about sourcing if something was generated or partially generated by um, an AI tool? Yes, yes. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, like when we put something out um, in our newsletter and, and or in communication, we call that part of our transparency where you'll mm -hmm. source it. And um, we utilize the APA guidelines because we're an academic you know, um, group. I mean, mm -hmm. and even though we're slightly informal, we find APA to best match our communication style. Mm -hmm. um, at least for citing purposes, mm -hmm. but different, um, you know, different MLA, I'm sure has their own, I'm sure Chicago has their own, but they all have guidelines for how to cite it. And we utilize that. And, and it says, you know, basically the date, what tool you used, mm -hmm. um, the, the prompt you put in, okay. which I thought yeah. was really great. And then um, how much of it you use, you can also say. Mm. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah, I've been experimenting, you know, looking at our, our survey data and trying to distill themes. And so that's always really interesting as well, just how quickly it can go through and pull out um, some clear themes. So thank you so much for sharing that, Stacy. We'll hear more from you in a little bit, but let's transition to Justin and how he's making artificial intelligence a hot topic. Um, so Justin, tell us more about your agency and the risks and opportunities that AI presented, because the number one thing that we all heard when it first came out is it's great for writing marketing copy. It's a great first draft. And that is your core business. So tell us about how you've, you've mitigated some of those risks. Yeah, thank you, Anne. I appreciate that. So um, direct online marketing, we're a digital marketing agency. I founded it 17 years ago. Super high level. What we do is we drive quality uh, people, quality traffic to our clients' websites and help them convert that traffic into leads and sales. Um, so just like you said, uh, from a marketing standpoint, you know, it's interesting. I, I began in the marketing industry 22 years ago. And at that time, the internet was the disruptor. And so starting the digital marketing agency was like, okay, great. We're kind of at the forefront. Well, turnabout's fair play. Uh, now you have AI disrupting our industry very heavily, just like it's disrupting so many other industries that we're all involved in. 
And um, our chair, Robert Powell, uh, starts every meeting we have at Vistage uh, with a couple of rules. And one of those rules is the T-Rex rule of adapt or die. And this is very clearly a case of if we don't start leveraging this, mm -hmm. we realized we're going to be out of business very, very quickly. Um, so I think the question you're asking in terms of like, how do we use it? What are some of the pros? What are some of the cons? Um, the time savings is just unbelievable. And that's what Shree and Stacy were talking about before. Um, one example to give you, um, we have uh, one task. So we started and said, where, where can we have the biggest impact? Did kind of an Eisenhower matrix, right? Or where is it the lowest lift for us to be able to do? And so we started with one task that we were just doing an inordinate amount of time on. Um, so on average, we'll uh, perform this task 500 times a month across one team. Um, on average, it takes about 35 minutes for us to do that task. So if you do the math on that, that's about 300 hours that we're spending every month on this particular task. So I'm looking at like 300 times what's my average uh, rates that we're paying employees in that and understanding what that cost looks like. Starting with AI, and we'll talk about how we built the tools um, if we have time, but um, that removes all the heavy lifting from that task. So the cost on doing that task now is about 15 cents per task. Um, average can be a little bit higher depending on what we're doing. The highest we've ever paid for that particular task is 33 cents. Um, and then the time that it takes is about one minute to input the information. And after that, five to 10 minutes of prompt engineering or rewriting uh, is part of it. So we've taken that 35 minutes now down to a maximum of 11 minutes. So we can use all that extra time for doubling or tripling our output or for doing doubling our output and then mixing in what are some of the more creative, more impactful activities we can do to drive success for our clients. So we don't even, again, have a choice. It is something that we have to do. I, um, like many people, I have personal concerns about AI, but from a business standpoint, we're not putting the genie back in the bottle. Um, it's something we're all going to have to adapt to. Yeah. You mentioned you're developing your own AI and you actually specifically developed a role in the company to really lead the charge. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, absolutely. And just so I was clear, because um, I, I think I might have said it in our uh, articulately prior, um, we're we're not so far at the cutting edge that we're developing our own like chat okay. GPT kind of uh, module. What we're doing is developing our own tools, and those tools are based on what's already been built and those new tools that are coming out every day into our own interface, into the own customized tools that we've created. Um, in the beginning, we had people playing around. We've been using tools for a long time, like many people have, um, or uh, whether full AI tools or kind of those precursors. Um, and then when ChatGPT came out, it was like, oh my gosh, like the whole world has changed. Like we, we now have the power at our fingertips to do these things we've wanted to do for so long. Um, so at first we did, uh, the dreaded committee. So we started <laughs> with that because AI can be used in so many different functions across so many different people within the organization that, um, we said, let's get everybody involved. And it really was great for brainstorming. It was great for, uh, news sharing. Wasn't so great for implementing and leading and putting things into place. So like you mentioned, we actually dedicated a role to this. And we're, we're a small agency. We're 35 people. Um, it's not like we have 50% profit margins as much as I wish we did. So it was a big decision for us to do that. Um, but something that we're starting to get the payback on now, something we're very excited about um, as part of that. And it's been a real learning experience because we've made some mistakes in the beginning, some things we just didn't know. There, I, I don't know that we could have done it better. Um, mm -hmm. we, we continue to learn and put things into place based on what we found didn't work. Mm. Well, part of best practice sharing is sharing what didn't work. So would you be willing to share some of the things that you learned for, for our community? Absolutely. I, I, I've been in this, uh, I've had this company for 17 years now. And every single year I look back and say, I can't believe how stupid I was last year. <laughs> so one day, maybe I'll be smart. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but with this, um, I think that one of the first challenges we had was really just um, 
understanding what was the infrastructure we needed to put in place to support this, right? So building out a new department, um, you kind of always have that tension of kind of like the creativity versus the implementation of it. And we were heavy on the creativity side of things and not so much on what are those things that we need to put into place um, uh, is around that. Um, we weren't... Um, we also weren't clear always on the end function of what we were looking to do because mm -hmm. we'd say, hey, here's a, a tactic um, around content creation. We'll start with that as an example. Mm -hmm. um, there was a similar type of content that we wanted to create, um, but different outputs depending on the person in the department that we wanted to use. But by not clearly defining the purpose and the end outcome, we had some missed expectations and then spent extra time going back and then saying, ah, this is actually two or three separate projects that we need to build out is part of it. Um, I, I think beyond just the operational challenges, uh, one of the one of the biggest issues is how quickly everything comes out, and it's really overwhelming to go out there and see what are those different tools. Sri is way ahead of me. I'm not using twenty or thirty different tools personally. That's too much for me. Uh, I have a lot of respect for that. But to give you an example, um, so the lead of our AI team, Chris, gave me a presentation Thursday, so just over a week ago. Mm -hmm. um, and he shared 10 tools with me that said, hey, I think these are going to have real big impact on us. I said, Chris, this is awesome. We have our all hands meeting on Monday. Will you share this presentation with the team? He said, absolutely, Justin. Uh, within that time frame, between Thursday and Monday, almost another 10 tools came out mm -hmm. that had potential impact for us to do, including three that morning. So talking about two business days, yeah, how has that changed. And so he made major changes to the presentation just based on some of those things that came out. So really understanding and keeping on top of things is a is just an enormous challenge. Um, the last one I would just share, last major kind of high level issue is um, more of a, a techie in the weed type of thing. But we will design a lot of times things on a single computer that the developer is working on and then taking that out into the wild for the rest of the team to use is like taking a lab experiment and then mass producing it. And so there's some challenges with, for example, putting things on the cloud that we didn't anticipate in the beginning. So having an understanding of that, of those resources and those skill sets would have sped some things up for us a little bit. Okay, fascinating. All right, so you really jumped in. Um, you were not going to let this disrupt your business, but stay ahead of it by investing. And it's, I mean, it it does sound overwhelming in terms of how fast things are coming out when some people are back on the, you know, I haven't even tried chat, chat GPT yet. Um, what, are, what are some of the, the, the things that you've heard from your customers in terms of, you know, how you've had to sell to them a little bit differently because, you know, are you, are they thinking that they could replace some of your capabilities with, you know, doing it themselves using AI? Yeah, it, it's a really great question and interesting. So first we expect that, you know, we're, we're in this crunchy period right now where everybody's trying to figure out, you know, wh what are the expectations? What should we do? We believe long-term that the majority of our clients are going to say, why aren't you using AI if we're not? Because they understand what the cost savings are going to be. And it allows our team to put more of our time and effort because we're not selling widgets. We're selling our time. Right. And they want that time to go to things that are going to be more impactful for them. So we expect that that's where it's going to be. And I think we have some clients on that end. Just like I believe Stacy was talking about earlier um, with some people that want to jump in, some people want to test the water with their toes. Some people are really a little more hesitant. We've had that same thing. We actually had clients uh, when we were experimenting, especially in the beginning with ChatGPT and, and creating longer form content, they would run it through, uh, and good for them, uh, a, an AI checker to say, hey, was this actually produced by AI? Did your team write it? Um, and then give us feedback and say, hey, you're at a 90% on this. What's going on? And so we hadn't done a good job of communicating with them of what we were experimenting with and what we were trying out. So that was a great learning for us on that front. Um, we've put a lot of time into, my new favorite phrase is prompt engineering. Uh, yeah. What kind of prompts are we gonna be using to get better results in what we're doing? Um, we've done a lot of time into how are we building tools 
to build personas, to build tone of voice, uh, those types of things that we can feed AI to be better for us. So we're investing a lot of uh, time and money and effort up front to get AI to be more effective and more customizable for what we're doing. Um, so again, I, I think in those early days, got a little bit of feedback, we adjusted what we're doing and really the, the commentary has been positive or just hasn't been commentary after the beginning. Okay, great, great. Well, I'd like to invite our other panelists back to just have a general conversation, um, some questions that I'd like to ask of all of you and give you the opportunity to ask questions of each other as well, because you all have different journeys and are leveraging different tools. Uh, but first, I wanted to start with the idea of prompt engineering is, is so fascinating to me. And that even back in January, when I talked to Daniel Pink and asked about AI, he said that, you know, humans are going to be needed for um, writing the right prompts to get what you need out of it. And then also for a matter of like taste and accuracy. And so I think that that's such a fascinating thing. What are some of the tools? How did you go about building that skill amongst everyone that's using that? So um, start with Justin and then go to Shri and Stacy. For us, what was really important, um, again, going back to Stacy's commentary about the people that were ready to jump in versus not, we definitely had some people kind of starting on their own. Um, some people are like, oh, this is too overwhelming. So we found it to be really helpful to centralize it in the beginning and to put together best practices and some how to's and even in some cases write scripts. So like tone of voice, we've built out 15 different tones of voices that we have the prompts and, and the information that we're feeding in so that if a client fits within that bucket, it's a great starting point for our team. They don't have to learn it on their own. Um, so we take that, we do our lunch and learns, we do our trainings, we get it out into the wild so people can do it. Um, and then, of course, they're creative people. They can experiment with it from there. And how do they want to change things up? But for us, getting people over the hump with a little bit of that starting point was really helpful. Yeah. Are, are you creating a prompt library or something like, hey, this this worked really well when doing this or like here are the components or is there a, a published resource that you went to to, to start learning all that? Like, what is the algorithm for writing a successful prompt? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I think in the beginning there was some, I think I started in this forum, it was like 324 great prompts to start with, right? So you start with that type of thing. Okay. Then you start experimenting around and seeing what, and then you saw um, like one of the things that'll trigger, and I'm going to use the wrong wording here, of the, the technical wording that's used. Um, but uh, one of the things that'll trigger, hey, this is AI, whether you're using a tool or just as a human reading it, is that AI will do a lot of, um, However, and all these little clauses at the beginning of sentences as transitions. Oh. And so there are some prompts that we have as libraries of don't do this when you're mm -hmm. speaking. There are other prompts you'll use that are, um, and I'm, I'm not going to use the exact wording because I don't remember off the top of my head, but explain it to me like I'm in fourth grade. Those types of things that are common that we kind of want to use maybe not all the time, but 90% of the time. And then there's other ones that are just more situationally specific. Yeah, yeah. Well, Shri, I think that's a great transition to you. You say you use this a lot for communication. So I'm sure you've had a lot of learning with, with prompts and audience and tone and things like that. So can you share some of your insights around um, prompt engineering? Yeah, absolutely. So the, I, I, I do want to take a step back. I don't use 20 to 30 tools. I have evaluated like 20 to 30 oh. tools i've narrowed it down to a handful of like four or five tools the one that i use quite heavily is hello scribe it's not chat gpt based and the one thing that i really like about it which there's one thing about chat gpt that really annoys me and that's you type it in like what you want and then you have to wait for it to like type out the response and that drives me nuts because the good thing about Hello Scribe is it just waits and boom, the answer pops up on the screen. So much better. I think Bard, I don't know what does Bard do by Google. Does it write it out? That That's really annoying. But anyways, let's get back to Hello Scribe. They've got 30 to 40 different built-in prompts that already exist. Um, you know, you can reframe, rephrase the statement, you reframe it. You can rewrite it. You can simplify. You can come up with a social media post. You can come up with a social media title. 
you can give uh, 10 different examples. They've got several different pre-built templates or prompts that, that you, can, uh, you can utilize. And then you can add uh, the type of tone. Do you want it professional? Do you want it to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger? So it'll have his, <laughs> his style, Sylvester Stallone. It, it allows you to kind of pick up those little things. So you can rephrase what you're trying to say in the tone of Arnold Schwarzenegger and it'll it'll rewrite whatever you're trying to say in that manner and it's 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 a lot of fun so that's hello scribe that's the real tool that i use a lot ghostwrite which is there for my emails that's based off of chat gpt so unfortunately when i tell it to do something i just sit there and watch it type it out which again drives me nuts i don't know why it's like that it already knows the answer why does it make us watch it do that but i guess that's part of the gimmick or or whatever it is or there might be an actual explanation for that, but uh, Ghostwrite has been very helpful. There you can tell whether it's casual or professional response. It's got mm -hmm. five or six other different things, whether you want a really brief response or you want a really detailed, elaborate, verbose response. So it'll, it'll, it'll say, yes, if you want to tell someone, yes, I'm coming over, it'll make it a three paragraph answer if you wanted to, to say it. And it does it somehow. So it's, yeah. it's pretty interesting what these tools can accomplish. And uh, yeah, you have to wait 10 seconds for ChatGPT to type it all out for you. But uh, that's 10 seconds less than the right. 15 minutes I would, have, yeah, mm -hmm. I would have had to spend to write it out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so now, that's my experience. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Um, to what extent do you check over or revise what, what these tools provide to you? Or, you know, how, what, you know, or is it 100% like that sounds great? Or are you editing it to sound more like you? So the two answers to that, depending on which tool I'm using, mm -hmm. sometimes I just get click happy and just keep re refreshing the answer until I get the answer that I want. I do that quite a bit. Uh, the other way that I go about it is I might reword the original thing that I've written so that it has a little bit more details if you're not getting what you want, it's because you need to provide more details, uh, the whole prompting. The more details you can provide, the more specific the answer will get, and then and then uh, it, it'll become more in line with what you want. So if you're not getting a result that you want, you probably need to go back and change the prompt, uh, the prompt engineering concept. Mm -hmm. uh, adding more details does make a difference. Uh, and then you need to add the details in the right manner so that it doesn't become, it, otherwise the whole message will change into something that you don't want it to be. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes I just refresh, refresh, refresh. I was like, oh, that's exactly what I want. So maybe you might, so Hello Scribe gives me three responses. Usually seven or eight times out of 10, I'll find the answer within the first three that I want. And I just pick the one that re reads the best copy it, paste it, move, move on with my life. Okay, great. And then over time, do those tools, um, I know, are they learning your tone and your voice? Are they trainable like that? Or each time it's it's a new instance? Uh, it's not, but I, I can, it, it, it gives me exactly what I want. So I'm not, I don't, I'm not looking for anything more specific that's m more catered to myself. Because uh, what the response I get out of out of these tools are better than what I would want to put. I think it, it rewrites it way better than I would have written it, and takes way less time. So I'm really happy with the results. Okay, great. All right, Stacy, on to you and some prompt engineering uh, best practices or learnings that you've had. Yeah, and I'll just say, um, Jasper AI does actually learn uh, learn your tone in case you're wondering, especially as like a brand, it's kind of nice, you know, to have your brand tone yes, there. Yes. Uh, as far, so one of the things we've done is taking the learning prompt engineering, a few of us took it, um, took a course on how to, how to do this better. And then we did some sharing um, across the team of like, what did we learn? We also do some just like, as I was mentioning before, live prompting. 
And we'll kind of support each other in noticing, well, when I prompt it this way, what happened? What other kinds of things can we do? And then we keep track of those best prompt practices. Um, we've also, of course, used pre-published prompts as a, as um, I think, you know, Justin, you were mentioning, like as a good place to start, you know, mm -hmm. let's just try those out. Um, but we really do find um, providing more information, as Sri said, uh, is better, right? Creating that scenario aspect and using um, different punctuation really helps. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, include X, right? And put that around that. And and that really helps, right? Write it from this point of view to this person. Like, so we get really specific um, about like what we're trying to get out of the tool. And when we don't, you know, she said, uh, go back, add more details or get more specific. And sometimes it still sets out something you're like, well, I don't know, but you can just kind of say, hey, add this in or take these words out or don't use as many X in there, you know, <laughs> um, which it will like it. So it, there's a lot of um, ways to kind of prompt to get an answer that you want or need. Um, and a lot of these tools now are also providing you some prompt ideas, which is also, again, an, a good way to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about a closed language model that that you're looking at that you're you're using that to train the AI? Yeah. So that we're building, right? You have mm -hmm. to utilize. So we're partnering with a development company who okay. uses that. But you have what they do is there's about as they've explained it to us, I'm a little low on the tech language here. Mm -hmm. So, but as they've explained to us, there's like four platforms that you can basically buy into to have this kind of generative AI, right? And so, and you pay in the form of tokens, right? And so similarly, you may see that on paid versions of AI, they'll say you've used X number of tokens, you need blah, blah, blah. Um, so what we're doing though, is building some assumptions in there around how many tokens different clients on a, on a you know, by size of school, um, may utilize our certain tool. Um, and then what we do is basically we control what the model is pulling from. So we put into the model, well, it's like the educate way of being um, different research articles. Of course, you have to buy them, right? And there's some that don't okay it. So you have to, you have to know that you have to know what are the copyright laws of these different articles and there's a lot out there right now about that and I think we're going to see more and more but we're just trying to follow so we're looking at what's op more open source and or like research that aligns to sort of educational or educate philosophy and then also like that data from the school um, and we also will put in sort of different things from the school like their strategic plan and their um, I'm trying to think they're like their mission and you know different things of that nature um, that really uh, help us control. So the output is coming from those controlled inputs uh, instead of just pulling from wherever on the web. But another thing you can do is when you're prompting on like a free tool like Bard or ChatGPT, you can also control where they're pulling from by saying, please only pull from X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. um, show me where you pulled your information from. Now rewrite this utilizing only McKinsey data, for example, right? Or, you know, so you yeah. can do that too on a free model as well. Um, you 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 often want to check too and just make sure, <laughs> but you can yeah. control that by, through the prompting as well. Yeah, yeah, we've learned about how AI can hallucinate and make up some things. So um, it's always good to, oh, yeah. good to check it, <laughs> yes. Um, so for, for our members who are considering how they might evaluate a, a third party that they would use to build a tool like this, like what was your evaluation process in terms of understanding that you wanted to build this and selecting someone to help build it for you? Yeah, and, and we actually have two prizes. I was mentioning our more robust one, but we're actually also using um, a digital twin uh, for, it's called um, Rocky AI, uh, and we're building um, a digital twin code how coach powered AI tool. Um, and so one of the things we were evaluating is, for example, how do we cut down on um, people heavy expense, right? Like we are a service industry. We consistently are challenged with how do we get above that revenue and margin and profit, et cetera. And so one of the things when we were looking for a tool, we were like, okay, are there tools out there that really match and mirror our philosophy of how we're approaching this people first 
Um, mm -hmm. And then also, is there something that can really help support us um, in integrating into our product and services really meaningfully, but also help us, you know, cut, um, save on just having as we grow and scale, also, you know, having to have people add people like sort of one-to-one. Um, -one. Mm -hmm. And so that's been really, um, I, well, that's still in process. So we don't know exactly where we're getting with that, but it's been really exciting to be able to test those out and see that um, as far as like alignment of philosophy, really it's like, how are you building your language model? That's something we ask. Um, mm -hmm. What are the things that you use and consider? Um, for example, Rocky AI uses positive psychology, right? Prompting, and that really aligns to our transform transformational coaching methods. So that's a more specific example of like some of the questions we ask. Okay, excellent. Going deep. Um, so I wanted to just open up. Do you guys have any questions of each other after hearing each other's stories or some, a commentary on some of your experiences? Justin, you mentioned, um, you know, your role is to help your clients, um, you know, gain web traffic that converts to leads and sales. So with the content, you um, are you learning how Google, you know, what does Google think of AI content? Like, how are you managing that to make sure that you are truly optimizing? And if there's any any risks there? Yeah, there there were some really um, interesting case studies that came out where you saw people just producing massive amounts of content early on by doing pure AI, um, little modification to it. Google, like it always does, then makes changes to its algorithm and... Mm -hmm you would see those sites just crater with their traffic afterwards. So mm -hmm. high risk, high reward type of situation. Um, Google is trying to catch up. It's put out what its current guidelines are. It's going to change those guidelines over time um, of what it expects. Um, but at the end of the day, what Google's looking for, Google's in business to make money, whether they say that or not. Uh, they're good capitalist com company, just like we like here in America. Mm -hmm. um, and they are wanting their users to continue to use their services because that's how they make their ad revenue. And their biggest fear is that they will produce bad results that people won't like the results when they click through and then they trust Google less when that happens. So they're just looking to make sure that the information is accurate or deemed accurate by the public and that it seems reliable and it goes in depth and it provides value based on what the person search is. So there's no reason, in fact, AI can help you with all of those things when done well, but when done poorly, it's gonna hurt the user experience. Google, Google tracks, it's gonna see the person came to the, your site and left immediately because the article wasn't good. So mm -hmm. all of it can, be, can work within Google's guidelines and, and expectations. That's uh, fascinating. And just the, the AI trackers, I think, you know, Stacy and education, you know, the concern that the kids will stop writing papers and how do you track that in terms of plagiarism and things like that? There has to be a lot of um, considerations for, you know, further educational tools in terms of evaluating content submitted by students as well, right? Absolutely. Um, and, and some of what we're trying to say to them is also what else can you do besides this, right? If if mm -hmm. if it can be written by AI, is there a different critical task that can be done and, and used within um, the classroom? So that's a big part of what we're also trying to push the thinking, not just like, is it plagiarized and is AI used for this assignment, but is there a more critical way then to create that assignment that and or partner, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. embrace it a little and say, hey, right go ahead, go out there and partner with AI. I wanna see what you first got from it. I wanna see how you push the thinking of AI. And then I wanna see what you added on personally mm -hmm. from your own touch, because we also talk about the risk of, right? This is like two years behind and sure, as technology gets better, that will shorten the the time frame. I'm sure of it, um, yeah. between like that current, the data that it's pulling from. But if we're not careful, we run the risk of having like no new creations, right? And so mm -hmm. how do you also encourage that from students? Like, what is it you want to be creating and putting out there in the world from you and your voice? And if, Stacey, I love that. If I can add on really quickly, everything you just said resonated with me from a hiring perspective. 
because we have a really detailed process for hiring. And one of the steps in there is a knowledge assessment. And so it used to be that we'd put out that assessment, right? And just, we got back and then we started to notice there was some stuff that just looked funny and we'd run it through the checker and it was coming back 95, hundred percent or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it caused a lot of internal discussion of, well, we probably are going to have people working with AI. So what is it we're really trying to measure here? And may, and we we haven't figured it out yet, but we're doing things a little bit differently now where it's like, hey, for this section, hey, we're looking to just flat out say, don't use AI. We don't, we just want you to understand what you are. And these other sections feel free to use what you want to be able to bring it in. And then we're using more of our um the Zoom or the in-person interview experience to dive in with somebody live having to answer to try to get what we were trying to get on paper before. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to jump in. I'll just talk on the AI. It it makes me feel like an artist and mm -hmm. you got to manipulate the tool in the right way to get what you want. So there, the, it's, it's an art form. And I've used several tools. I've used Jasper. I've used Copy AI, Word Hero. There's a big list. I've gone through a lot of them. And then I landed, you know, for me, I like Hello Scribe. It's it's the right brush for me. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think people do need to get out there, experiment, and then find what is the right tool or tools that work for you. And uh, it's 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 fun. It's fun. I, I just it's a lot of fun. If you haven't played with it, you just gotta get out. Use Bard, it's free. Use or get chat GPT. It's worth just trying spend an hour on it if you haven't done it. Uh, and then and then I think once you get started, you you start to realize, well, gee, it maybe you can do this for me. And you go in and try it. And that's that's kind of I think how you, you get started. And be careful once you get started. There's no <laughs> turning back. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So for for everyone thinking about ahead to budgeting or strategic planning for next year, um, what is your top advice for how to integrate AI capabilities, training, personnel, policy guides? You know, what, what would you say the one thing from your point of view would be important to include? So Sheree, we'll start with you. Uh I don't think it's that expensive. Uh, it is, there's a really low bar. Uh, lifetime deals. I mean, it, it can become expensive, but right now it, it's been it's cheap for me as of today. Okay, Justin, anything to budget for? Uh, personnel, uh, applications, etc. Yeah, I agree with Shree. It's it's really inexpensive, even if you're using like GPT-4 versus ChatGPT, and it's going to get less expensive because you have Meta coming out with their open source version and everything else. So there's going to be a ton of tools that you might say, hey, I'm going to use this one for math. I'm going to use this one for coding. I'm going to use this one for writing. Um, it's going to become very fragmented very quickly. Um, just based on our, you know, things that we've learned, I would just say the planning process is really critical. Um, you know, use your time in the beginning to experiment, but then really think through, do you want to have a dedicated person? Do you want to have a committee? Do you want to have 10% time to everybody on your team to experiment with? Just think about what makes sense for your organization and really spend the time thinking through that. Okay, right, excellent. And Stacy, I would echo a lot of what Justin said. That's a lot of our approach. Um, we also like to think of it as uh, we always have a product um, development line. Um, and so really considering, are there products you want to build yourself with a partner? Do you want a digital twin? Like, is that worth it to your company? I mean, part of that is evaluating that, but I think that training those committees, um, ensuring that, you know, those closed models, you have to create your modules, right? So like, mm -hmm. are you budgeting for that um, to put in, you know, to put into those products that you might create, be creating yourself? Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights, Sheree, Stacy, and Justin. And thank you for our attendees uh, for being here today and your great questions. We will be sending a link to today's recording and within 24 hours. And there is also the AI network where I'm going to ask Shree and to maybe drop in some of the tools that he used. I know he dropped that into the chat as well. 
Um, but that's a great way to connect with your fellow Vistage members to really hear about how they're leveraging AI and ask some questions from experts like Stacy, Justin, and Shree who have already started down this path. Um, also for our members, please don't miss the exclusive conversation with Adam Grant, best-selling author. His latest book was Sync Again, and that's available to watch through November 25th. And on November 17th, we have our next webinar with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, where Ron Ishog will sit down with our Chief Research Officer, Joe Galvin, to go over the state of the government and the nation to best prepare you for short and long term as we head into an election year and what policies might be most challenged during that time. I think in our Vistage on the Hill session, they called it the silly season. So for our members, you can register for those sessions now at vistage.com slash webinar. That's vistage.com slash webinar. We also have a number of things on demand if you missed them. I love the conversation with our Vistage Speaker of the Year, Robert Cujo Teschner, who spoke about de-weaponizing accountability, and Hillel Presser, who shared details on how to protect your assets. So thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day, be safe, and be well.